Greetings, comic book nerds, and welcome to episode 18 of the Polis Podcast, a bi-weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. My name is Chris Poirier, and with me, as always, the one, the only, and I finally get to say this, Hector, as seen on DC Universe's The Swamp Thing, episode number four, Mirai! Hey, everybody. It's about time that we had a, <laughs> an anime, an anime intro. Like, oh, y- yes. You know, you know, I want I want an anime intro. I want the like weird pop song that doesn't actually have any relevance in in a completely different language, where people can just picture us statuesquely staring off into a sunset. You know, I'm ready for that I mean, intro. That seems. I seems that seems fair, and also I just wanted to be able to correctly just glorify in your half a second of bearded blurred goodness <laughs> in in swamp thing and that's why we just love everything nerdy and we love we, we love you hector and congratulations on your official acting debut in dc universe so kids strap on in and prepare yourselves because we got a great show for you today and you know what that means we've got comic side so on today's episode of the pull list we've got quite a show for you we're going to hit the latest news we're going to talk about dc comics recent imprint realignment super exciting stuff here in the industry i know it sounds that way but you know but specifically a little bit about dc black label and some of the other things that are coming up and all that plus those awesome awesome fresh comic book reads that are in our polls and in yours from the last two weeks two weeks see i can speak i hate it when that happens don't you but this is the pull list podcast yeah it happens to the best of us and we are truly excited to bring you the comic news for the week so really hector you know starting right off the top and we're gonna talk about it a little bit more later but i the thing that jumped out to me this week was that DC announced that they were going to shutter the imprint at Vertigo after about 25 years. And kind of part of that whole thing was a consolidation of their comic book line. And we don't want to waste it all here, you know, literally, as we say here. And all across the Love Thy Nerd podcast network, uh, we're going to save it for the podcast a little later. But but we're on the just, podcast, Chris. We're I know, but it's going to be later. So this oh. is just the reminder that a really important conversation is going to come later. But this is where Chris is just going to wallow in sadness a little bit. And we need a moment of silence for the imprint that was formerly known as Vertigo and the home of such wonderful things as Preacher, as Transmet. Um, so many things, uh, Hellblazer and Dude, just that I, kind I mean, of, that's the thing. Like, okay. I know we're going to, I know we're saving it for the podcast, right? I don't care. <laughs> oh um, no. <laughs> um, I appreciate the things that Vertigo makes and, or has made in the past. They've made some iconic things, but dude, I don't know the last Vertigo thing I'm buying. Um, uh, deathbed. Huh? Deathbed. Did you read Deathbed? Josh- no. Joshua Williamson? Oh, uh-uh. yeah. Um, absolutely bonkers. It was a few months ago, but it was the last kind of newer thing that Vertigo did. And, of course, Josh is writing uh, The Flash, and Deathbed is absolutely nothing like The Flash. So it's kind of what happens when you know writers get to explore the other half and get a little more of a comfortable place for mature things. because So he, it was really went- burn for The Flash. Uh, no, 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 it wasn't. He, it was completely unrelated. It's just same writer. Okay. Um, but he did go for the record, I believe, of the most amount of Wang in a comic since Watchmen. Just just saying. Oh. Um, yeah, I, it, it surprised me. But so if you're going to pick up Deathbed, um, definitely not for the kitties. Just saying. Um, but... The thing that surprised me even more in the news is that hits like a lead balloon to a lot of the cult following of Vertigo. And within like 48 hours, if that, DC rolls around and announces a not a new imprint, but is going to have an imprint tag and label on the front of their comics. And that's House Hill Comics. And it's going to be a horror line, which wouldn't, wouldn't that be terrible if they already had a place to do that? What was that called again? Oh, right, Vertigo. Um, 
But the good news but, is, and I am excited about it, is that they pulled Joe Hill, um, son of Stephen King, um, pretty awesome uh, horror writer, uh, also known in comics for Lock and Key and a lot of other cool projects to write a bunch of mini horror things under the DC uh, label. So not going to lie, in the same breath, it feels weird, and we will talk a little more about it later, but it's a good get for DC to land Joe Hill um, over to their side of things. So that is super exciting. And then because it wouldn't be comics and industry news without something really, really strange. Um, but how many of you out there have heard this and you can comment later on this show and Hector, you can give me your immediate input is Marvel announced that they were releasing scripts and rights to high schools for three theatrical performance programs. So, you know, you have to pick up plays from writing companies and whatnot, so you have the licensing rights to actually perform them on the stage. Well, Marvel said that the MCU wasn't enough that they needed your local high school stage, and they have given us three superhero-related high school plays. And I don't know what to do with that information, except that it sounds cool. I have. Well, I, I, I personally love it. Um, it's an it's a neat idea. Well, okay. I've got three kids, and right now I'm at the place in life where I'm forced to watch my kids' plays, whether they're good or not. <laughs> um, Fair. And uh, yeah, and for the luck, for the most part, like I'm grateful. You know, I've seen my kids do a production of Mary Poppins. I've seen my kids do a production of Aladdin. I've seen my kids do a. One of my kids did a professional production of Annie. Um, I'm okay nice. with those, but like I didn't want to have to watch Fiddler on the Roof. Um, <laughs> I I didn't for wanna... the re- for the record. I do want to say I've probably seen The Crucible no less than 27 times in my adult life because of high school performances, including the one or two that we did when I was in high school and college. So there's that. Or same with The Tempest. So, yeah, no, a little bit of something different is definitely welcome. Well, dude, I personally did six productions of The Crucible in a four-year window. Well, there you go. (laughs) This guy gets it. um, I... I'm grateful for that to happen because if my kids get to do like a Spider-Man or, you know, just what, I don't even know what the the properties are, but like if my kids get to do a superhero theme, awesome. If I get to watch my kid be winter soldier, I mean, I can't, there's, you're going to bring dads into theater. You're going to bring more kids. Cause listen, if a kid gets to watch a theatrical production in their school, of something they mm-hmm. already enjoy, you're going to spark the theater program. You're going to help the comic book. I, this is this is a bigger win than DC's Walmart thing. Um, hmm. So as no, that's far a really as, good like, point because you you're going to have the chance to do it because every middle school and high school across this country is doing theater. Throw Marvel yep. into the mix, and you could do some big things, or you can be like my schools in my area that. You know, or me personally, that you know have no regard for the legalities of uh, stage and production. Um, <laughs> yup, and they just do what they want anyway. Because like I totally led a uh, bootleg production of Doctor Horrible and Once More with Feeling from Buffy. So you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, we do what we do. Wow. The theater has no laws. Um, <laughs> I, I, but, I believe they actually do, but that, that's okay. <laughs> the theater has no laws. It's the stage, okay? That's fair. Um, it's the stage. How, how dare you crush my creativeness? Uh, with your legalities and licensing. Um, but no, I think I, I'm actually <laughs> I'm pretty excited to see this. And I've got a six-year-old, so I want to I see. I want to have a Guardians of the Galaxy play by the time this kid's in high school. So... Right. What's up? No, I, I, I mean, other than the complete humor of it seeming weird, I think we're both in agreement that it's actually a really creative way to get the content into high schools and possibly hit a new cross section of folks to find interest in what are already really well done created stories. So, I'm all about it. It sounds weird, but now I want to see what they got now, and what they delivered. Think about how many theater nerds, and that's me, by the way. I'm not saying that offensively. 
Think about how many Same theater here. nerds yep. uh, are into or were into High School Musical and slash or Moulin Rouge and slash or uh, the one that Greatest Showman. You take you, the. You just came at. You just came at me. I'm sad, but go on. All right. You think about how many people were into those things, and then you combine that with Marvel. Boom. It's a win. It's a total win. So keep an eye out. Your local high school might be dropping the marquee for some cool superhero stuff. Get your kids involved in local theater. It makes them into awesome people, truly. All the awesome. So, I mean, we turned out all right, didn't we? Shit. Maybe. <laughs> Um, uh, moving, moving right along. Um, so says, says the other my thing two second com- clip on Swamp Thing. Um, yep, done. See, IMDb see? From, from the high school stage to IMDb. Hector is a walking example of comic goodness and theatrical talent. I did. So, I did, will say though, my beard looked good on camera. So cheers. Yeah, no, it was <laughs> a good look. You done well. Um, so. The other thing coming out of Marvel this week, which might be the downer for some folks, is somehow I managed to miss this in the local news for a while, but the current run on Doctor Strange is actually not solicited beyond number 20, so there's only a few more left, and it looks like Doctor Strange is going to sunset for a while, and who knows for how long that's going to be. But So if you've been following Doctor Strange, I guess you, you get to wait a while, and you can dig back into the pile of all of Doctor Strange's shenanigans of cross history because Mar- Marvel's not going to give you anything new, at least not beyond August, I believe, right now. So if you're into it, I dig it. Mark Wade's been doing some work on that book, and it's been really great, but I guess it's just got doesn't have the numbers right now so number 20 is going to be your last chance to see dr strange currently and we'll see what happens from that point forward for me that's kind of there wasn't a super ton of news like last week because last week was like bonkers or the last time we talked but i think you had one thing that you just wanted to talk about in terms of x-men and dark phoenix so hector lay it on us so uh just one of the things that stood out to me most is a. Uh... You know, everybody had their thoughts on the potential underwhelmingness of X Men: Dark Phoenix, and you know, just it's it, it fell in that weird place of you're coming in after the Marvel buyout, knowing that your franchise is dead on arrival. It's a, it's a hard place yep. to have a successful uh-huh. movie, and uh, <laughs> yes, uh, plus. It kind of has felt like the X Men newer generation films have been declining um, steadily. I thought X Men First Class and whatever one immediately followed it were dope. X Men Dark Phoenix had the worst domestic opening of any modern superhero film of a major studio. Um, oh, filed like, under awards you don't want to win? Yeah. Now, uh, that's a franchise thing, and I'll I'll specify some things in a minute. But, I mean, that's just its opening weekend, but uh, domestically. But domestically, it ranked at the bottom of the X-Men franchise. The entire bottom. The very worst. You're talking about starting out from the original X-Men movie, all the way, including the Deadpools, all the way to here, it had the worst domestic movie opening of any of the X-Men franchise. If you want to go ahead and lump Oof. it into the Marvel franchise, it had the worst domestic movie of any Marvel franchise film. And just for some lovely salt in the wound, it had the worst <laughs> domestic opening of any DC film either. So, you know, for y'all oh. to just, for just, if you just want to, you know, really lay it in there, you know, Green Lantern. Um, whatever. Uh, uh <laughs> Ouch. But just don't make this suit animated. Uh but we're in that place where even a juggernaut franchise, which to be fair, the X-Men are a juggernaut film franchise that uh, having a property does not mean a guaranteed success even in the comic book industry of where we're at and you know they had that the only film Worse on domestic openings of the major franchises was uh, the Fantastic Four reboot of 2015. Um, And what I find so funny 
is not only was that worse, but it was done by the same dude. So the same person brought us oh, no. X-Men Last Stand. And then somehow later, they let this <laughs> dude have another crack at a, a, you know, a Marvel property through Fox. And he gave us Fantastic Four. And after Fantastic Four, they not only let this dude touch another movie in the <laughs> hero universe, they let him write and direct it. Um, I even read an online report that spoke of the fact that they intentionally hired him to tank the film to uh, burn the ground, you know, scourge the earth of the love of all things Fox X-Men so that Marvel had an easier way to build their way back up. Ooh. I don't love that if that's true. Uh, so, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you I- did it, and you did it with arguably one of the most outstanding X-Men storylines or what should be and certainly was in comics. Right. Ugh. And so that's the thing that if if they did that it's so depressing. It is. It's totally depressing. Moving on though, but if they did that, that's 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 horrible. But, you know, it's just one of those things to stand back in modern times and watch something so big end so poorly that would have been like if endgame Oof. you know would have been man you know the original hulk movie so and that's about where we were um so that's that's just my thought just to watch the x-men that's film franchise really unfortunate, uh, but i guess i mean i haven't had a chance you know, to see it yet way. so I'm probably not going to rush out to see it based on what a lot of things have said. I will watch it at some point. Absolutely. So if some of you all out there in podcast listening land have actually seen Dark Phoenix and have some thoughts on that, you know, hit us up in the Love Thy Nerd community. Tell us a little bit about um, what you enjoyed or, you know, if kind of everybody's kind of right on that one, unfortunately. But, you know, that's part of comics. We can't we can't hit them all out of the park. And we've been, you know in 15 plus years of like really good content. So can't knock it. We're finally doing some things great, but you know, every now and then that's going to happen. But now we can idly stand by and hold our breath and hope that Marvel integrates all those properties that they have obtained. And we see some really great product out of fantastic four out of X-Men and out of so much more that, you know, I'm excited. So I'm looking forward to it, but that is, is pretty much going to do it for us in terms of news for this week. And as always, you can join us on the Book of Faces at Love Thy Nerd Facebook community. Just search for that, and you can find us, and you can join us. And join in on that weekly geeky conversation that we have, and let us know what we're missing, what you liked, what you hated, and probably even the stuff we missed, because Hector and I tend to do that. But that is pretty much the news, and... Let's get on with the show, and let's talk about all those wonderful, sweet, sweet comic reads that we picked up from our shop over the last couple weeks. So, Hector, uh, what was in your pull box the last two weeks? I'll say this. One of my surprisingly good pulls lately is Glow Number 3, the uh, comic series based on Netflix's (laughs) – such when you say all this stuff out loud – the comic book series based on Netflix's adaptation of the 1980s female professionally wrestling series of the same name, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, which... I'm not judging you right now, but go on. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, when I say it out loud, I'm like, boy, none of this sounds great. Um, but, <laughs> with a, with me, I, I enjoy the show a lot. If you're a fan of Tina Fey, if you like Tina Fey style comedy, humor, depth of character, stuff like that, um, the actress that plays the main character in Glow is very much a young Tina Fey in her Mm. presentation. And I think that's a lot of what gets me. Um, Anyway, uh, back to Glow number three. You know, I just picked it up, like, and I'm pretty much at any given point, I'm like, I'm kind of done with this already, but, you know, I'd like it, and I didn't realize season three was actually happening, so now that I know season three is actually happening, I might not 
keep going. But then I pick up issue three and there's just a couple page panels, a couple pages of panels. That's honestly some of the most in depth and insightful dialogue I've read in a book in a while. Um, like in a comic book. Um, but it straight up is just pure insight on leadership and character and opportunities. And I'm like, I'm reading just, you know, I took, you know, some pics of three of the panels, but it's just pure good leadership training. And, um, I was impressed by that. Uh, well, it's, uh, if you're familiar with the story at all, the, the glow girls end up being going to Vegas and, uh, they're trying to figure out what they're doing with their lives. And, uh, one of the girls is a self-imposed leader. Um, she's never had that capacity, but she treats herself like the leader and everybody else just kind of runs with it. And, uh, it blows up on her and she, she's running from that. And, uh, she goes and hides in a van where the owner or manager of the whole thing is just hiding in the truck, eating tacos. So she starts to eat his tacos while he gives her life advice. And, um, you know, it was like, honestly a really touching scene and partly i'm heartbroken i'm not going to get to audibly hear it um because i really admire that actor's delivery and i think it'd be dope but anyway so glow number three was a good one um and uh you had mentioned some stuff on social media and i know you're gonna have some thoughts with it but uh uh, not that this is my pull recommendation but i did read batman 73 and um (laughs) Yep, yeah, we I, we both definitely read it. Prep yourselves. Man, what the crap is happening with Batman? Um, because I legitimately... This is the first time since, I think, the run called Dark City, which was the run that immediately followed Hush, um, that I just want to give up reading Batman. Um, Ooh. and if you've listened to me, you know, I'm a DC fanboy. Um, yep. I saw, I don't remember who it was, but, uh, it was something in the love thy nerd community. Uh, and you know, it was a comment and someone posted, yeah, Hector is great. Even if he is a DC fanboy. And I was like, taken back. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, how dare you? But I mean, I know it's super accurate, but you know, to hear someone else say that's like, you know. I'm I'm balanced and fair, but whatever. Um, How dare you, sir? We're completely no. Never mind. That there's probably a lot of truth to that. Yeah, um, but it's the first time in a long time. I just straight want to walk away. Um, I defended Tom through the nightmares thing, even though I know in retrospect it's not great reading and it should only be a filler. Like you know what? I just the just hitting me right now. Nightmares. Should have been a after the story filler for the actual book. I probably wouldn't have hated it in that context. And Nightmare. I th- Good. I think even for me in this book, the one thing like there was a comment in the middle of this book of, you know, whose nightmare am I in? I know I'm not in this one. I was like, I swear, Tom, if this is technically another nightmare in a nightmare type thing because things have been really bonkers this is not helping well no it's just this this i mean this is not great uh i if you if you pile all this anytime you use the power of the internet to pull all the times i've defended tom king's long game storytelling you'd probably be able to fill it's a a hour it's a lot because i'm always you know he's got a big picture it's a long game it's okay y'all it's not okay. Um, I just read we might this. Have hit how, we might have hit how long it actually has to be, and apparently it's shorter than we thought it should be. Yeah. <laughs> and should be? I bet, if, just, just to put it in perspective, the entire book is Tom Thomas Wayne singing a song. Yes. In a very, as creepy as possible as well. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I know that we're trying to get to a place in a remote desert, but y'all got planes. <laughs> yeah, y'all got teleporters. Y'all, I mean, we, this is... Bat, Bruce and Tom, 
Thomas got resources, and even if you're trying to forcibly take your son somewhere, you got better means of transportation. Um, they I took just, the long way, absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely the wrong long road home, and it was painful. Like I legitimately, as the pages turned and I got in, I was like, "What are you doing, Tom?" And why am I spending money on this? Because that's one of the things, you know, he said, we're at issue 73. He said issue 75 is like the game changer. Like. Oh, get me there then. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm like, stop. Or at least give me something more than the conversations. Because if we had just cut the song portion and added some dialogue. If you had given me some meaningful dialogue writing, because literally, think about what the script looked like for this. Oh, yeah. You could fit this script on a (sighs) post-it. He definitely went to the art team on this one and went, go through the desert. Take your time. (laughs) Oh, and there's a horse. There's a horse. Oh, and I'm dragging a coffin. And I'm not telling you anything more about that family, because you're going to need to pick it up. I, do this is do we me- not tell this, anything? Because this is this is messed up. Is no, we're we, we're saying we... that this was this was really difficult, but for the coffin punchline, it's almost worth reading this in some capacity, so you can go. Okay, no, seriously, what is going on? I I just want to talk about it, but I understand we're being respectful. But whatever. You get you get one more week, and then maybe we'll talk about the coffin because wow. Well, the next issue will be out by the time we do this, right? Yeah, and it probably will have a lot to do with said coffin. And I'm willing to put everyone on notice now of if you're hearing this conversation now, guaranteed we'll probably be talking about what's in the coffin uh, in the next episode. What's in the box? We know what. What's in the box? No, you're you're good. Let's not. Please, no. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. We got that out of our system. So, what else did you? What else did you pull? <laughs> uh, Wolverine exit wounds. Um, just a three piece little story on Wolverine. Um, uh, but it had like Larry Hama and Chris Claremont. Ooh. And dude, a Larry Hama written Wolverine story. Was really good. I mean, it was it's old school classic. This. Whoa, 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 whoa! Hold up. Are are you saying nice things about Marvel right now? What? Wolverine's not DC. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, uh, you know, I'm a Larry Hama. I, I've, for, by the grace of God and all these comic cons we do, I've ran into Larry numerous times, and I have some friends that are hardcore GI Joe fans, and yeah, you so. Do. Larry is their, you know, golden child. So yep. part of me, I picked up this book just because my friends love Larry Hama. It was like one of the main reasons. I've met Chris Claremont, and he's a wonderful person to have a dialogue with. Um, yes, he is. All this said, it was really good classic Wolverine. Like, early 90s, it felt it felt like, hey, let's have a 90s Wolverine retrospect. Um and also give it some anime vibe. Now, I'll say that for the first, there's like, it's a few stories. One of the stories is, uh, just put it this, it's Wolverine versus Venom, but it looks like it's drawn by the Mac, or people that do the Max. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's Wolverine knowing he can't stop Venom, but just trying. Um, so there's that story. There's a story of Wolverine... Making ramen in <laughs> Asia for a family and teaching young hooligans respect. And personally, I can read I can read a book of Wolverine making ramen all day. It was entertaining. <laughs> um, um, and then there's just one of the whole Weapon X story. It was a, it was a very solid. If you like Wolverine, give it a shot. And that's a and it's one of those deals where uh, I was at our my local comic book shop. I had already picked up what was going to be my pulls for the week, but then standing around my local comic book shop, I ended up grabbing other things, and this was one of them. And I'm really glad I did. Um, 
And then just the other thing for me is uh, Superman Year One. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we saving this for imprint, or do you want me to go ahead? You could do a little bit here because we're going to okay. talk about just its presence in the imprint discussion next. But uh, yeah, that I mean, even for me, I really enjoyed the story. So I want to hear what you have to say because I know some folks, at least in my circles, didn't love it. And so, yeah, what, what, well, what were your thoughts? I enjoyed it. Um, first of all, how are we calling this year one when it takes place over five years or ten years? Two. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. You can't call this Superman Year One when it goes from the gra- from the cradle to high school to graduation. That's not right? Superman. Yeah, he's in, he he shows up on Earth in the classic story, and then we're like post high school graduation by the end of the same book. Yeah, you can't call that Superman Year One at all. Um, I get that. Hey man, we're it's, get- it's it's Frank Miller. I don't think you can talk that way about Mister Miller. I'm just saying. But it's not year one. <laughs> it's not. That's a decade. Um, that's a decade and some change. Uh, but whatever. If, if this would have been a much more uh, Superman Begins, you know, appropriately titled. Um, but man, Ramita knocked it out of the park. Um, oh yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. It was pretty. Um it was raw it was well written um yeah i i i came away going wait people didn't like this it it felt nice that you could tell it was ramita but it was ramita very clean um right and the art that's the one thing we can talk about kind of next is the it, this first book was not a black label title uh uh-uh. uh if if it's supposed to be Black Label, supposed to be the home of DC's mature stuff, it kind of scares me where this book might go. <laughs> well, no, and here's the here's the other thing with that is that uh, a lot of this, if you read it with the dark intent in mind, shows that it at least by some people's perspectives that Superman's a sociopath. Um, okay. because if yep, you, I can see that. Uh, if you think about his responses, he wasn't actually feeling the things that he was feeling. He was thinking, this is what mom and pa expect of me. Right. He was thinking... Oh, that's a good point. He was thinking, this is socially acceptable. I need to make this look. I need to hurt this person, but not draw blood. I need to do this without doing this. You know what this felt like? If you actually... If you take the context of Superman out of everything and you just read Clark Kent's thoughts, it's an episode of Dexter. Oof. Okay, yeah, so maybe maybe we will be going someplace interesting. Because I mean straight I up, I think if you if yeah. you think about the dialogue of what he's thinking internally, it sounds just like Dexter internalizing his kills, his relationship with Harry, all the things. By the way, Dexter's a Showtime show about a serial killer who only kills bad people and then wraps them in plastic and dumps them in Miami's harbor and ends terribly. Going on. But, but, yeah. it, but it's okay as long as you hurt bad people, right? But they were right. all bad. Shh. Don't rationalize that, Chris. It goes bad places. <laughs> oh, sorry. My bad. What? Superman, you're one. Got it. But that's the thing. It's either a super pure Superman story, uh, or it's the setup of Superman being completely detached and dangerous. So, yeah. Needlessly put, I think both of us are looking forward to where that story is going and super curious where it's actually going. But for the record, I had no problem buying this book, and I had no problem paying the extra cost. This was, without a doubt, one of the best Superman stories I've read in a while. And uh, oh, also, this is, and I don't even know when this book came out, so I don't even know what to tell you. Um, I picked this up Two because it, it was on the, uh, oh, no, no, no. The, um, holy cow, this is an old book. Never mind. So, Amazing X-Men number 14 from February 2015. Okay. Uh, I found on a clearance rack at the local comic book shop, and it's an issue where Nightcrawler has lost his soul. And is planning to kill the religious judgy people in a community 
and Mystique doesn't want that to happen, so Mystique spends the entire episode stopping Nightcrawler from killing people. And it was a really fun read. Um, but I found it on a dollar rack at a comic shop and bought it, so that was fun. Going on. Ah, very good. Well, let's see. Uh, some of the stuff that I pulled out of my wonderful pile, um, I decided to make my choices rather eclectic for the week because I knew we would talk about all the the mainline stuff, but just to continue giving the love to our friend uh, Kevin Eastman, uh, Drawing Blood number two came out uh, during this period. And of course, this is the book that Kevin and Ben Bishop, Avalon, and a ton of other folks that are all kind of together have been, they kickstarted it and they're now self-publishing. So returning to those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle roots, this is published under Kevin Eastman Studios own mm-hmm. label. And has just been telling a fun, it's kind of a satirized retelling of kind of part of his life. And the experience of creating Turtles, finding money, co-creating Turtles, uh, finding money, losing said money, losing contracts, selling stuff out to other people. And um, something about Russians and or Lithuanians. But you know what? You need to pick that book up and find out for yourselves because it's still pretty fun. And you can find that on all your local comic shops, or they should be able to get it for you now because it's through previews and everything. But you should check it out. It's fun. Um, I've always enjoyed Kevin's art, and it's got that overlaid with a lot of Ben Bishop's work. And those two are just doing neat things. So you've heard me mention both of them before. And of course, we've had Kevin here on the show that it's worth checking out their stuff that they do today today because it's fun. Uh, I also picked up I'm still reading Ascender, which is the natural sequel to the Descender series from uh, Jeff Lemire. And, oh, man. Dustin Nguyen he, art, man. Ooh. Yeah, right? It, art, the books are beautiful because of that. But Jeff did it to me again for issue three that came out this week. And it if some of you follow me on the socials of the media, as you saw me post it, and it's because Descender had a few moments where you literally read it you put the book down and go, no, no, seriously, I'm not crying. I'm not. Dang it, Jeff. Um, and he hits you with another one of those moments that actually ties back to important parts of Descender. Um, that I don't know how that dude does that, but he has a way of making you become emotionally attached to some of his characters in really weird ways that when he shows you a new part of their past, you just get wrecked. And he did that and... I had myself a good healthy cry Um, because he just does relationships of his characters really, really well. So as I've told a lot of people, if you want a really fun sci-fi story, but also is going to punch in the gut a couple times because of the interrelationships of characters and everything, you you need to read Descender and then you need to keep reading in Ascender because the story goes on and it's glorious, it's beautiful, and... All of the things. So if you're looking for everything that comics can deliver outside of superheroes, you should be reading books like Ascender. I'm just saying. Well, and that's um, that that kind of threw me off because I didn't read Descender and mm-hmm. I picked up Ascender number one on a whim. Okay. I'm like, this is vast and beautiful, but I've got no freaking clue what's happening. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's a little difficult because it is based upon the foundation of the world that came before it. And that was 50 or 51 independent issues five trades um five or six trades so i i could see why it was a little confusing but it is beautiful it is beautiful uh, i'm a i've been a dustin to win fan since he took over one of the hush runs back in the day so yep and so so good but so those were kind of my independent slash off the wall kind of stuff for the weekend but the two things that we definitely had to talk about from and One's DC, one's Marvel, but I'm still enjoying The Flash, The Flash 73, who um, Joshua Williamson is in a year one story, and it's actually in a year one. So we can, we can at least give them credit that in Flash, we're, we're in a single year and everything's great. And it's still really good. And the back and forth of Barry getting his new powers and figuring out what that is, his relationship with Iris West all over again. But the entire story is backdropped against a fight with the turtle. So literally the the dude that has the opposite ability to him, Um, the dude that could slow things down versus speed things up. And it's been a really fascinating kind of push and pull between the two characters and the turtle kind of also doing that whole thing of, "I I can smell you flash. I know that you 
are a speedster and they're kind of playing off each other in that whole thing so if you dig the flash and you want to see a really well written kind of year one revisitation to some of early barry and iris and all that it's been super fun and finally you know i'm amazed that you didn't even mention it at least a little but daredevil number seven yeah you're waiting on me that's fair because daredevil number seven daredevil chip sadarsky's daredevil run we've been saying since the beginning is just amazing well i need to find more adjectives in positive reflect (laughs) because holy wow not only does this book still just like gorgeous but the entire current arc is, you know, Daredevil is like hung up the thing and has fallen back on his faith of the, I need to figure out how to keep doing good things without being a vigilante and being the guy I used to be because he got pushed so far that he accidentally killed a dude. And we've talked about that. So that's not a spoiler. Um, but that the conversation that Chip's been unfolding is very theologically deep. Um Oh, there's some and seriously deep panels just between him and that one sister. The, yeah, the nun. Um, that So if you're just looking for really solid... Daredevil has been one of my favorite Marvel books for a while because it's one of the things that feels like old school Marvel to me. Um, where it's very big set pieces, there's action, but there's also the issue of the individual and their actual life and, and, and the things around them. And that just makes me excited for comics because I think that's what happened in the sixties and seventies at Marvel is we saw the human beings underneath the mass and chip is just knocking it out of the park in terms of giving us that look of what a superhero in struggle looks like. And it's fascinating and you should be reading that book. Well, you should. And like, uh, it took me, I waited like five issues before I picked it up and not because I didn't think it was going to be good, but just because I knew I'm going to get to this eventually. And I'm glad I did. But one of the things for me is that it fits really well into where the daredevil has gone in the last years, not even just that it fits well to the previous, like this feels like a good progression because what uh, a few year, a few, what runs back or maybe the last run was the death of daredevil. Um, was and you know it felt like i why am i reading this i know he's going to turn right back around and be daredevil um and he did for like a second and then it lost it and then we actually see this that you know it wasn't or it made it made sure that the other arcs didn't feel arbitrary um or wasted like it actually showed that that stuff mattered but like uh one of my favorite panels um in that daredevil thing is it if it it's very reminiscent to old Batman books like Going Sane, um, mm. where without Batman as a catalyst, the Joker doesn't know what to do. And uh, when the same way you've got Fisk without Daredevil, doesn't even seem to care about crime anymore. Um, he's got this one panel. Just this is just one panel. Says I've grown. This is Wilson Fisk says I've grown content. Have you ever seen someone of any worth be content? In business, mm. you lose hunger. As artist, uh, in, bi- or in business, you lose your hunger. As an artist, your work grows stale. To be content is to be dead. Um, and he straight up says, like, without Daredevil to fight, he's grown content. And um, he even goes on to say he feels nothing. Dude, I mean, it's just like watching Fisk, you know, make that struggle and everything else. You know, I'm I'm an easy person to please. You give me some superheroes and Jesus, and I'm happy all day. So, you know, the yep. spiritual the there spiritual aspects of this are great, but when you actually make the Wilson Fisk arc of this just as compelling as that, you're doing great things. Yep. No, it's truly great stuff. So, there's a ton of really awesome stuff in and on your comic local comic shop shelves and you know what? There's just been so many great comics over the last few weeks, but you know, we've we have this segment here about, you know, the stuff that you guys are reading and we always want to hear what you guys have, you know, the loyal pull list podcast listener and what you have in your poll. And well, for this episode, we need to acknowledge just about all of you on our usual suspects list from the love thy nerd community, because, well, um, I think almost a hundred percent of you in the comments this week said, you got to be pulling Spider-Man annual number one, which is the spectacular spider ham. So Peter Porker, all that good stuff. And you know what? I, I actually picked it up um, because I saw that I got my books late 
this week and saw that. So I picked it up, but we got to thank Adam Elliott, Nick Simpson, uh, Jonathan Reedy, Michael Brown. You know, you've heard these names here before, but now you get them all back back to back. (laughs) So when I looked at it this week and went, wow, like 100% of you said we need to be reading this book. It was like, I guess we need to pick it up. So for the poll for this week, if any of you out there missed it, it was super fun. It was Jason Latour, Rico Renzi, and all the old school folks from Spider-Gwen and some of the other stuff getting to do Peter Porker in a bunch of short stories. And it looked amazing, and it was fun. And that's all that really matters. So I, I gotta from say the bottom the, of the yeah, go Howard for it. Duck and uh, <laughs> Howard the Duck and Spider-Ham little segment at the end was my favorite part. <laughs> nice. So from Hector and I, we just want to thank each and every one of you for keeping us honest and making us read Marvel books because, well, we need that every now and then. And we humbly submit to you that this was a good poll for this week. So everybody make sure you get your chance to get out there and pick up. You don't need a lot of prior background, so you can just pick this book up and enjoy it. So We love getting to hear about all this stuff, like we've said, so don't forget to hit us up every Wednesday in the Love Thy Nerd Facebook community and tell us what you're reading, and we might say your name right now and talk about the awesome book that you told us to pick up. So we got to move on with the podcast, and we got to hit that topic of DC making those big moves that we talked about a little earlier when the show started at the top of the show (laughs) of making changes to imprints so... DC's basic business philosophy here appears to be that they want everything to hang underneath the DC Comics title, which makes sense. It's DC. Um, But that they were going to do away with Vertigo, which was an existing imprint. And for the sake of this conversation, I think it's important that at least based on where things are kind of today and stuff changes in comics a lot, that an imprint is tepid. Technically, what was a smaller company that a larger publisher either took on or created where they have independent editorial control within that thing. That sure, there's still a DC um, EIC editor in chief, but imprints typically have their own editorials and space and left and right areas that they can operate in. They usually have something that holds them all together. Vertigo was kind of horror, hyper mature usually graphic um, in nature. Um, Lots of, well, like mystical stuff was present in there as well, which isn't really fair to separate that from regular DC, but kind of. So the idea now is that everything's going to hang under main DC and main DC editorial, but with individual silos or labels that identify different age groups, that that was what they wanted to do was everything's going to be DC, but we now want to say very clearly Black Label is our adult mature line. So not for the kiddies, regular DC universe stuff and DC comics are going to be just like they've been, um, but usually sit in that teen, teen plus. And then they were going to relabel some stuff for young adults and teens and for the kiddos. So part of that makes a ton of sense. Um, But then in the same breath, like we were talking about earlier, they then introduce Hill House Comics, which feels a lot like an imprint. Uh, Young Animal has not been mentioned at all in all of this, and they are an imprint um, headed by Gerard Way and the group over there. And in fact, Young Animal's new slate of comics start coming out next week. So to say the very least, it's a little confusing. Uh, what they're ultimately up to, but it's something that we just kind of wanted to get a talk about. And Hector, you you rained on my parade and said you're not going to miss Vertigo, and I'm sorry for you and all of the wonderful comics that have clearly hurt you. But tell me kind of what what you're seeing in in all of this and uh, what you think about what they're doing, and does it make sense? Is it confusing? I mean, it's comics. It's always going to be confusing, right? <laughs> well, to me, just just as a... You know, looking at from where I stand as an individual reader, as a parent, things like that, um, I don't even... I think Vertigo had gotten to the place that it had become the odd duck that unless you were specifically looking for a Vertigo title, you wouldn't even be considering it. Um, You just picture your average comic book shop. You walk in, you go to the new release section... You go to the Marvel section, the DC section, the indie section, whatever. You pretty much know what you're looking for. Vertigo has was in this place 
in my perspective, that they weren't likely to just be garnering new people. Mm. Um, that they they weren't poised to reproduce. That you may put, be fair. You put everything think, under a DC label. Mm. If you put everything under a DC label and clump it all together, you're at least lumping it in the same bubble with Batman and Superman and the stuff that people are going to naturally gravitate to. So no, that's an interesting but, point, and maybe maybe part of the experiment that probably makes some sense is uh, not a ton of new stuff came out under Vertigo, but um, like we mentioned, Deathbed definitely was. But the most recent stuff is the reintroduction of Sandman Universe and Gainman's stuff that was new product underneath the old Sandman lines. You know, Lucifer came back dreaming and lots of other stuff. Carried the Vertigo label because that's where Sandman originally came from. But yeah, I would say that not necessarily from when I was in the shop day to day, it wasn't usually new people looking for that. It was the people that had already fallen in love with it and were looking for it. So maybe maybe you've got a little something going on there. Oh, well, think about it. The only Vertigo titles the average non Uber nerd can crank out are the things that have already been incorporated into DC. Watchmen and uh, yep, v for Watchmen's Vendetta. In regular, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. Nope. That's a good point. Actually, I'm not sure. Right. Was Watchmen wrong. originally. I'm trying to think. I actually want to double check Watchmen. I don't know if that was Vertigo. It might not have been, but like V for Vendetta was. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and it's awesome. those it, it's those books that are, you know, the darker DC books that people still recognize as DC books, even though they're Vertigo. Right, and yeah, and DC for Watchmen, it was DC regular. It would have okay. made sense because Alan Moore did a bunch of stuff under the Vertigo line, um, and they did reintegrate Hellblazer, um, John Constantine into the regular line, and he Hellblazer was part of. Uh, rebirth before it got canceled um so yeah there's there's something to be said for that I, I think the only thing that sticks out to me is some of the heritage of being off the wall that was vertigo is a thing that kind of bums me out personally and maybe it doesn't matter in the long run of retail and everything that something that i'm just longing for goes away that's fair but in announcing to me it's i usually look at the comic book publishers and go why are you doing the things that you're doing and the articles where they said that they kind of buried that Vertigo was going to go away as well as it was kind of an under point uh, was we're doing away with imprints, except they still have them, just no more Vertigo. And it's a strange message to give to a handful of your fans that granted, it's probably not the f- a group of fans that's going to bury the company. But you did basically say, yeah, Vertigo's kind of been nothing but trouble, but we're going to keep paying Gerard way for Young Ink Animal, even though... Unfortunately, a lot of those books ended up being late, and they had to restart the line twice in the first two years, which most people didn't notice as well um, because of that. And we're about to see the next relaunch, but those aren't DC books. Those are young animal books. Um, So it's just confusing marketing to me in a bit. Maybe that's me being over-semantic in the place, but it's always just fascinating to me to see things like that and see what makes those decisions drive the industry. Is it creatives that are driving it or is it executives looking at bottom lines and somewhere in the middle is what the comic book industry should be. I think. Well, for me personally, I, this is what I would have done. If, if you had given me the option of doing this, I would break it down into three categories. I would break it down into kid friendly where my six year old can go pick stuff up. I would have your standard stuff and then I'd have your twisted and (laughs) you know, and a lot of, in a nutshell, that's where they're pulling. But then again, like how we looked at, obviously we've only seen one book of Superman year one, but uh, you know, it doesn't quite fit like it feels in that one. It feels like it could be your standard stuff. Um, And then you look at things like uh, Batman white Knight. you know, that got retroactively added to black label. But then again, that also doesn't feel like uh, it belongs in that place. Yeah, a conversation that actually popped up at my local comic shop was a bunch of old school folks kind of having the conversation of, you know what, just bring Elseworlds back. At least a good chunk of DC fans know what that means, and you seem to have a bunch of stuff that would fit under that particular label. And yeah, it, it's just interesting to see the back and forth of the comic book industry doing these weird things of, None of this is really new. It's just we always call it something different. And I don't know. It It's always fascinating to me. 
I kind of just wish more stuff would be streamlined so not to confuse people. And if you were doing the thing where, like you said, that it was the three layers and you're done, I almost think that would be welcomed at this point because it would make things way easier. Um, because we're going to get reintroduced into a world where, oh, we've we've streamed on everything. Everything's great. We've got regular DC, which has DC Universe and DC Comics, where one is fully continuity and one is, well, kind of not. Uh, we have Black Label, where adult stuff happens, which isn't continuity, but some of it might be someday, but most of it won't be. We have Hill House Comics, which are going to be horror, but that's going to come and go, and we'll just remind you that we have horror when we have it and when we're going to do it. And we've also got these wacky dudes over in the corner called Young Animal that are giving us Doom Patrol and stuff that's like just straight off the wall crazy. And it sounds like we're kind of back where we started. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're going to have to continue to prune this if they're going to get to the goal they want. Um, I, I think the goal of streamlining stuff so that people know what they're picking up and it's okay for the kids or okay for the teenagers or it's the really crazy thing I'm looking for is a great idea, but actually do it. Um, in many ways, I think that's why Marvel does have the control of the market and the shelf that they do. It's all Marvel. There isn't anything off the wall or different with Marvel. It's Marvel top to bottom. Um, and even though we get annoyed with them doing like crazy minis that are out of continuity and they just kind of happen. It's much cleaner though, because people are like, Nope, that's got a Mar Marvel logo on it. Good to go. Um, I know exactly what I'm getting out of that book and I'm done. So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I really hope they kind of find a way to clean up what they're trying to do. Cause I think there's a great benefit to it from a retail side and also just reaching more people with new product. Yeah. Yeah, or that, you know, it's just a way to put more posters in shops and keep people guessing. I mean, if comics were easy, uh, I don't know. I I don't even know what the end of that sentence is. To be fair, but the one of the joys or hatred of comics is this right here: the reality that the comic book publishers are always going to be doing different things to try to get our attention, to attract us to new stuff, but to always keep us reading. So. I, I guess maybe at the end of the day, I got to do a Kevin Smith thing and say, at least we're having a conversation right now about whether it's a good idea for DC Comics to eliminate imprints, which for a lot of people is a conversation that probably would not be happening in 2019. <laughs> so if I have to be happy about things in general in the industry is the big two are still having conversations about how do we ensure that people keep enjoying comics and that we don't fall into disappearance or overpublication like we did in the 90s. And I'm completely okay with that. That at least these conversations are being had and new outlets for creatives are being provided. I mean, it's they're not they're not okay being complacent or just giving us what they thought. I mean, I've appreciated that as even as far as like, you know, New 52, Rebirth, these things of like clear restarts, clear cut guidelines of this is where we are. It's nice. Sometimes, like yep. with a hundred issue Batman story, it can go too long. Um, but you know, at least we're trying. Yeah, I, and I think to be fair, lots of really good content is being produced. The smaller companies are growing; they're not shrinking, which tells me that good things are happening because creatives are still being brought to the table. Wait, wait, wait! And Rob Liefeld wasn't right. <laughs> hey now i was like can we seriously go two episodes where you say not incredibly nice things about rob i mean come on well oh, come on last week was the first time i said anything <laughs> ever i said two episodes in a row you oh, said no. the man can't draw feet that's not fit uh, no, bro that's, that's factual <laughs> that's not a hector opinion that's not even salt that's like yeah that's that's fact yeah, if you still haven't looked that up, you probably should, but, you know. Nope, uh, I I think it's a great thing that we, we're seeing in comics in general, and I I do mourn the loss of Vertigo um, personally, and I know that some of y'all are going to raise your candles up with me, um, but hopefully what we'll still see out of it is that some of those characters and stories don't go away. I don't imagine they do. I think we see some of that stuff potentially come back in black label or in the main line here in the near future. So I am cautiously optimistic of the future is kind of, I think where I end up on that one and long live comics. I don't think there's 
this isn't a destroy the industry type conversation. So that's the good part to it. I just thought it would be interesting for us to provide a little background in an industry making decisions with how, how they label their comics, which seems strange, but it's only strange in the context between Marvel and DC because they're so starkly different in terms of how they do these things. And there's a lot of history in the industry wrapped up in them as a lot of imprints came from acquisition that they were entire companies um, until they were acquired. So it's an interesting thing. And we just wanted to kind of give you a primer on part of the conversation to, if you're interested in those, then you should be looking up the history of things like Vertigo and the titles that came there and what's happened in DC over that time, or even where young animal came from. Cause that, that one's very recent. That's within the last three, four years. So it's really neat stuff that's going on. And that's kind of a little peek behind the curtain at what's going on out there. And it's just wild stuff. But the good news is comics are still being produced each and every week. New reads hit the table and the shelves in your local store and through your apps and everything digitally that we can consume comics in so many more ways than we could even five, 10 years ago. So I think some people try to also hang their hat on these things being the death of an industry or, oh, these are things freaking out. I don't think that's what's happening. So, you know, like we always say, you just keep reading more comics, man, because there's so many good stories out there and so many cool things. But Hector, I, I think we've had almost as much fun as we can have in a single hour of talking about comics. So that's going to do it for us here on the Pull List Podcast. Episode 18 is in the can and now in your earbuds. But we couldn't possibly do this alone. And as many of you know, we take this unbelievable journey of podcasts and fandom with two other amazing podcasts that are part of the love thy nerd podcast network which we are humbly a member of here on the pull list and the first one is humans of gaming with drew and chris where they do interviews with game designers producers and creators and really get to the heart of why those creators create the things that they create and what makes them tick and then we have Bubba, Matt, and Kate over on the Free Play podcast that covers, well, just about every other nerdy thing in between. And it's funny. It's super fun. They do a really great job over there. And you just need to check it out and see what's going on on those two other shows. And hopefully we're just going to keep growing here at the Love Thy Nerd Network and you'll get to hear more stuff in the future. So keep your ears kind of open and you'll see what's going on out there. But Hector and I, truly from the bottom of our heart, we want to thank you guys for choosing us as your primary source of all things comic booky and generally nerdy on a near weekly basis. So don't leave us hanging. Go and click, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcasting app of choice. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and so many more. We keep trying to add stuff each and every day. And you know what? If you can't find us, just make sure, you know, go over to the Google and look for thepolispodcast.com and you will find all of our episodes and our wonderful pictures and our wonderful bios that we've spent so much time almost no time at all on writing but you can see who we are and why we love the comics that we do but seriously from the bottom of my heart and i know hector as well feels this way thank you for listening and remember kids read more comics